The Cardinal Virtues and the Three Eminent Good Works Excerpts from The Catechism and Example by Father Chisholm Imprimatur Franciscus, 1909 Chapter 1 The Cardinal Virtues The Virtue of Prudence There are four virtues which are called cardinal virtues. They are called cardinal because they are, as it were, the hinges on which all other moral virtues turn. The four cardinal virtues are prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. The first cardinal virtue is prudence. Christian prudence requires of us in the first place that we should make our eternal salvation secure by knowing, loving, and serving God, and also, if necessary, by sacrificing all the goods we possess in this world and even our very lives in order to secure for ourselves hereafter the joys of paradise. There once lived in Rome a young man whose name was Francis, who was a great favorite of St. Philip Neri. From the time when he was quite a little boy, the saint loved him with a special tenderness, because he was so gentle and so pious. He was clever too, and learned his lessons with great care, so that Everyone said he would become a great man some day and make a name for himself in the world. When he left school, he entered a lawyer's office, where, in a short time, he became so famous that people even among the nobility and at court began to speak about him. Unfortunately, this praise which people gave him began to have a bad influence upon him. He who used to formerly be so fervent and so pious, and who went so frequently to the sacraments, now became so much taken up with his studies that he shortened his usual prayers and went to the sacraments more rarely and with less fervor. St. Philip observed this falling off and was much grieved at it. One day he sent for him to come to his house to speak to him. Francis went at once, for he loved his dear spiritual father with a great affection, and although he had at this time some forebodings in his mind that he was about to receive a reprimand for his negligence, yet he went. When he reached the room of the saint, he sat down in his usual place at St. Philip's knee, and looked up into his face, as if to ask him what he wanted to say to him. The saint put his arm around him, and lavished upon him the most endearing caresses. "'My own dear boy,' he said, with a sweet smile on his countenance, "'my own dear boy!' So you are busy at your studies, and you intend, I hear, to gain for yourself a great name in the world. Oh, happy you! And then you will, no doubt, be made a doctor of law, and begin to gain money. And then, my child, what then? Then, father, continued the youth, I, I may become an advocate, and then some day, perhaps, I may be a prelate. And then, said St. Philip, and then, said Francis, I may become a cardinal. And he went on with great enthusiasm to enumerate all the honors he might one day obtain. After each one that he mentioned, the saint always said, And then? When he had finished describing all the honors he could think of, St. Philip said again to him, And then, my child, what then? Father, said the youth, this is the highest dignity to which I can aspire. St. Philip then, pressing the young man's head to his bosom, whispered once more in his ear, And then, my child, what then? These words, so tenderly said, made such an impression on the mind of Francis that on the way to his own house, and when he reached it, he kept continually saying to himself, And then? I am studying to get on in the world. And then? What then? They seemed to sound in his ears whatever he did, or wherever he went. At last he said, Yes, oh my God, then I shall have to die, then I shall have to be judged. What is it to avail me then to have gotten on in the world, and to have become great here below? When I die, all will be over, my fame will be at an end, and the praise of the world will be of no use to me, and perhaps because I am trying to gain these perishable things I may lose my soul. Oh my God! I will no longer think of these things, but from this time forward I will serve thee alone. From this moment I will trample under my feet all human praise and seek only to gain merit which will last forever. And then, ah yes, 
and then I shall be happy. He returned in haste to St. Philip, and threw himself at his feet, and besought him to receive him at once among his religious, where he would be able to serve God more faithfully. One of the most important things we have to do while in this world is to discover in what path of life God desires us to walk, so that we may serve him as we ought. Our happiness in this world and in the next depends on this. The virtue of prudence causes us to have recourse to God, that he may be pleased to make this known to us. Robert, the Student of Lyons There was in the days of Alberic, abbot of Citeaux, a young student at Lyons named Robert. The one desires of his soul was to serve the one desire of his soul was to serve God with his whole heart, and he prayed with the greatest fervor to God to make known to him in some way or other the state of life in which he desired him to live while in the world. God heard his prayer and showed him in a vision what he wanted him to do. He thought he was standing in a valley, and that he saw before him a very high mountain, on the top of which there was a large and beautiful city. He felt a great desire to enter that city, and he set out with the intention of going up to it. But when he came to the foot of the mountain, there was a great and very deep river, over which he had to pass before he could reach the mountain. He went up and down the banks of the river, looking for a place by which he might cross over it. But as the river was very deep, he could not find any. While he was wondering in his mind how he could get to the other side, he saw on the bank opposite to him twelve or fourteen poor men who were washing their clothes. One of them had on a tunic of snowy whiteness, and he was helping the rest of his companions each in his turn. The student asked them, Who are you? The one in the pure white garment answered, These poor men whom you see are monks who are washing away their sins in the waters of penance. I am their Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. The city which you see up there is heaven, where I reign with those who have done penance. This path you also must follow if you desire to enter paradise. The student told this vision to the bishop of Chalons. My child, replied the bishop, you must become a religious in the monastery of Citeaux. He went there at once. When he came to the gate, he knocked. To his astonishment, the monk that came to open it was one of the poor men he saw in the vision. As he went into the monastery, he recognized each of the monks as he met him. He then told the superior the vision he had, and how he had seen all the monks in this vision. This fulfilled them all with great joy, and they thanked God, who had granted him this vision for their encouragement. St. Aloysius renounces the world to secure his salvation. St. Aloysius, full of the Christian virtue of prudence, had one thing continually before his mind, and this was how he might save his soul and obtain the eternal reward of heaven. In order that he might effect this more easily, he resolved to renounce his title to the Marquette of Castiglione and all his worldly prospects, and to consecrate himself entirely to God in the religious life. As soon as he obtained the consent of his father, he prepared to leave his paternal home forever. When his vassals heard of it, they all shed tears of unfeigned sorrow. O Lord Louis, they all cried out in the midst of their sobs and wailing, Why are you going to leave us? You are the heir to the magnificent estate, and your vassals are the most attached to you. Besides, the natural love they have for you as their prince, they love you for your own sake. We have placed all our future hopes in you, and now, when you have come to the age of to rule over us, you go away and forsake us. The only answer that Louis made them was this, My friends, in leaving you I am seeking only the salvation of my soul, by laboring to obtain the glory which can never be taken from me. You know how difficult it is for one who possesses the goods of this world to enter the kingdom of heaven. My only desire is to be there forever with God. Let every one of you think of this and have this desire also. Agnes, the Foolish Child A little girl whose name was Agnes had just reached her fifth birthday. 
Her father made her the present of a new dress, and her mother invited their friends to come and dine with them in honor of the happy day. Agnes's godfather was there also, and when the child ran to meet him, he put into her hand a sovereign in gold as his gift. Agnes, as may well be imagined, was full of joy when she saw the beautiful piece of money and knew that it was all her own. She showed it to everyone who came into the house. When her parents were at dinner, and when she had her share of the good things upon the table, she left the room to amuse herself at the door of the cottage. Just at that moment, a countrywoman was passing by, carrying a basket with fruit. Agnes ran towards her and cried out to her, Look here, look at the beautiful piece of money I have. The woman took the coin into her hand, and seeing that it was gold, said to the child, Yes, it is indeed very beautiful. But see, here is an apple which is larger and still more beautiful. I will give you this large red-cheeked apple if you give me your little piece of gold. The child looked at the apple. It was indeed very pretty. Yes, she said, I will give you the money in exchange for the apple. When the woman received the money, she went away at once and was seen no more. Agnes, after admiring the apple for a few moments, thought she would run and show it to her mother. Look, mother, she said, look at this beautiful apple. Where did you get that apple, my child? Oh, a good woman that was passing by gave it to me for my little gold farthing. Is it not beautiful? When her mother heard this, she became very angry, and her father gave her a severe scolding. But her godfather said to them, Do not find fault with the child for what she has done. She did not know the value of the piece of money and it was quite natural for her to give it away for that beautiful apple, which she thought was much more valuable. There are many people more foolish than that child is, who at the same time think themselves very wise. For there are many who sell the endless joys of heaven for the miserable things of this world, and there are others who, for the pleasure of a moment, lose their souls in eternity. This child has given us a lesson which we should never forget.